Hello friends, there is a case of umbilical hernia, primary umbilical hernia and we are planning a robotic TAPP mesh pair of this hernia. Now, if you see, this is our area of interest that is umbilical defect, almost 2 cm in size, ziffy, pubic bone and costal margins on either side. And if you can appreciate this is the area of anterior superior ilex spine. The patient is in supine position and the plan here is to insufflate the abdomen from palmar's point using various needle. And once the abdomen is insufflated, we'll mark the area of interest. Normally, for majority of our primary umbilical hernias, we make markings of 15 into 15 centimeter around the hernial defect. See transversely 7.5 on either side midpoint and then craniocaudally 7.5 centimeter on either side. Now normally in our routine practice if we are dealing with primary umbilical hernias the normal size is around 2 to 3 centimeter that's why these markings and if we are dealing with larger hernias then probably the size of the marking as well as the size of mesh will be slightly different and similarly anybody can choose the size of the marking as per their convenience. This patient has good abdominal panels and what I mean is has optimal space for port placement. Now typically these are the types of patient if you want to start your robotic or laparoscopic TAPP journey for ventral hernias, a BMI of around 30 male patient primary umbilical hernias with good abdominal panels are the patients to start your journey. This is the level of costal margin and we are marking at almost 10 centimeters here. Uh, normally we can keep at 7 to 8 centimeters but since this patient has good panas we went further laterally and this is anterior superior ilex spine. This is a rough marking of anterior axillary line and we normally tend to be proximal to it. Uh, I mean the limit of port placement should be proximal and we try not to go beyond this line. The level of second or the camera port uh, at the level of umbilicus and the level of third port and if you see carefully we are at a good distance away from anterior superior ilex spine. Here roughly the distance between our ports is 7 to 8 centimeter and we are almost 10 centimeters away from our line of incision that we have already planned. You might not get such conducive abdomen in all your cases and there may be scenarios in which the abdomen is small and the distance between two ports might be a challenge. It might be around 5 centimeters. Although the recommended distance between the ports is around 8 centimeters, uh, with time and experience, this can be done with uh, these ports as well. Early in experience, what we can do is we can start with a 5mm trocar from the palmer's point and then we can place the robotic trocars under vision. Coming back to our case now, so uh, before placing our first port, we typically give 20 to 30 degree of left up tilt to the table and then we place our first robotic trocar. One can also use an optical entry here for placement of first port that can be later on changed or upgraded. We need to be extremely cautious and careful while putting our first robotic trocar and once we placed it inside abdomen we quickly do a diagnostic scopy there just to be sure that we are not causing any kind of injury to the visceral structures and there you see the various detail now if you see carefully this is the level at which the patient's body is placed and the hand is hanging by the side with some kind of underarm support so that there is no kind of interference between the robotic arms and the patient's hand or the table Now the second port that we are going to place is the lowermost port 
and we are just ensuring that we are good distance away from anterior superior leg spine. If you see here, we are almost three, four finger breadths away uh, from anterior superior leg spine, almost in the line of uh, on the marking that has made earlier. After placing these two ports, that is the upper and the lower ones, we place our final, the camera port, right in between these two ports. Once ports plates, we select the anatomy, that is in this case renal and the site from which patient cart is coming and then we deploy for doctor. We will be using three arms here, so I am screwing away the first arm and we will be using a third arm as the camera arm. Right? We need to ensure that uh, the cannula and the robotic arm are parallel for docking and also ensure that the cannula doesn't come out at this moment. Once the instrument clutch light becomes solid, it is ready for use. The camera is ready for use. You can gently press it and take it under your control and put it, the camera inside abdominal cavity. Now, what we are trying to do here is we are trying to select the target anatomy. It is important to note here is that we are not targeting the anatomy as umbilicus and we always select the target anatomy as the distal most point of dissection. Once targeting complete, we quickly dock our both arms. Again an important step, the instrument insertion. So when the ports are placed and the instruments are in place, uh, can you appreciate the black and yellow line? That signifies the uh, location of active instrument and the insertion has to be under vision. Once stocking is complete and all instruments in place, we burp all our arms before moving on to surgeon console. Here you can see this is the clearance button that can be used to improve clearance in between the arms in cases of crowding. Here we have good space in between the arms without any, any kind of overcrowding and we are good to move to the console now. After doing diagnostic laparoscopy, we reduce the hernial contents. Now this step can be performed laparoscopically as well, especially if the content is bowel. I have a fenestrated bipolar in my left hand and a scissor in my right hand. We make markings onto the peritoneal surface along the intended line of incision first and then gain access to the periperitoneal space. Now to start with, my camera is 30 degree up as we are working onto the roof here. Initial incision on peritoneum is tricky as if one is not careful may enter retractor space and then gaining back access to pre pattern space is a bit challenging. Now you see, I'm using my left hand here to create some space into the pre pattern space first and then using my scissor to incise it. It can be very well appreciated here that the peritoneum is super thin and I'm using my left hand instrument to grasp it and then divide or push it. Now, when I'm holding it with my left hand, there is no haptic feedback. So you need to be careful that you use your visual cues or visual feedback for this dissection, as it may cause button holes if you're not careful enough. Once we start approaching midline into the pre fatty area, the dissection becomes much easier. Patient selection is important whenever we are starting doing TEPPs for ventral hernias. Male patients 
of BMI around 30 small primary umbilicals with minimal or no red divergation are good to start with. It is always tough to do TAPPs in patients with large divergation. The idea should be to bring down all the fatty tissue and bear the posterior tissue sheet. However, in areas with fat deficient peritoneum, some components of posterior tissue sheet can be brought down. We do dissection all around the hernial defect first, cranially as well as caudally before dealing with the hernial defect. We graze walk along posterior to sheath and try to bring down all the fat. The beauty of true pre dissection is that even a small defect into the PRS like this one can be identified and dealt with. We start working near the umbilical hernial defect and reduce the hernial sac. We need to be careful that we do not cause any atrogenic injury to the umbilical skin. And the role of bedside assistant is crucial here. Now we are dealing with the supraumbilical hernial sac and we try to bring down the hernial sac intact whenever possible. After defining the boundary of supraumbilical hernia, we then deal with the umbilical area. All this dissection is being done with camera in 30 degree up position. Switching camera to 30 degree down becomes helpful in dissection beyond this point. Throughout the surgery, the common steps that we have been performing are we are retracting tissue with our left hand, we are buzzing with the right and then pushing it. So it's retract, buzz, push, retract, buzz, push and swimming maneuvers whenever required. Also throughout the dissection, we are being guided by bedside assistant or surgeon who have been using compressive forces and letting us know the limit of our dissection or the areas in which we are dissecting. Again, as we start approaching the distalmost portion of the dissection and the peritoneum gets thinner and thinner, we got to be careful as there is no haptic feedback and inadvertent buttonholes can happen here.
we always try to create larger pockets wherever feasible. Now we have completed our dissection here and now we are defining the boundary of dissection that is again guided by bedside assistant or surgeon. We also go a few millimeters or a centimeter more beyond the predetermined areas of dissection. This helps us in better placement of mesh. We used barbed 1O non observable suture for defect closer. After taking few rows of sutures, we reduce the intra abdominal pressure, maybe to 6 to 8 millimeters of mercury, and then we approximate the sutures. Now, here we are closing the hernial defect as well as the umbilical ring area, and then we divide it using suture cut needle driver. This is a 15 into 12 centimeter mesh that is being used here. We find unfolding the mesh easier if it has been folded from both the ends toward the center, unlike here where it was folded from one end. Point fixation of the mesh can be done. Now you can use sutures, tackers or glues as per your convenience. If we are using sutures for point fixation, air knotting should be done. Normally, I would do point fixation at the four corners. Unlike this one, where there is some memory and therefore I am taking a couple of bites more. typically used barbed 3O absorbable sutures for flap closure. The importance of forming large peritoneal flaps can be understood here. Now whenever we are making large peritoneal flaps, the flap is redundant and therefore there is less chances of buttonholes when we are closing the peritoneal flap. This brings us to the end of the procedure. Thank you for watching.